Hi, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, so uh, I'd like just to say um, I'm going to, to focus here on one particular case, which is um, exploring a, a bit the, the issue of resilience in North communities, in refugee hosting communities. Uh, and this is based on a review paper uh, that we prepare with a view to this conference uh, with uh, some of my three colleagues, uh, Arthur Mabiso and Kali Evonen, and uh, one of my university colleagues, uh, uh, Joachim van der Kastel. So first of all, I'd like to say that I'm sure that many people here have much more experience in refugee settings. Uh, so I'm really open to, to hear about what you have to say, to, to share some experiences. Uh, this review is basically what Sorry, we believe. Uh, Jean Francois, there is a lot of seats up front, and there is no reservation. So please, those people <laughs> here, everybody are everybody is equal in this room today. So there is no reservations here. So please, don't hesitate to come up front. It's almost empty up front. Emmy and so on. Thank you for coming up front. So I'm sorry, it's not Francois. Please right. continue. So basically, this, this review paper is also an opportunity to, to have a kind of dialogue between researchers, practitioners, at least that's the way I see it. Um, so as a way of motivation, uh, as Schengen fans said yesterday, uh, we, can, we have seen that food insecurity has globally decreased over the last decades. Uh, but however, there remain some kind of big pockets of food insecurity in the world and in particular in conflict-prone areas. Um, we also know that conflict has very detrimental effects on neighboring countries. This is, this is something that you find in the literature, which is very strong. So um, some people have actually argued that uh, refugees may be at least partly responsible for these conflict spillovers. So for instance, head of states and governments and their representatives at the World Food Summit in 1996 declare that major refugee movement can cause food security problems also in receiving areas. Um, the, this kind of statement is mainly based on this kind of geographical coalition uh, where you just um, uh, look at the coalition between hosting refugees and food insecurity. Basically the problem is we believe this coalition is misleading. Uh, we can actually show in the paper that if you simply remove country heterogeneities in this kind of coalition, the coalition disappears and even becomes slightly negative. So why is it so misleading? The simple answer is coalition is not causality, but uh, basically most refugees are hosted in neighboring countries. And these neighboring countries, they face food insecurity problems for many other reasons than hosting refugees. So the fact that this coalition disappear could tell us basically that maybe this relationship is not as systematic as people have thought, or simply that to some extent this relationship is diluted into national statistics. But more fundamentally, what we argue in that paper is that cross-country analysis is too limited to shed light on the complex relationship between refugees and the hosting population. And also, it's to some extent too short-sighted um, most of the refugees live in protected refugee situations, so they have the refugee status for more than five years. So you need also to look at the kind of long-term implication for the hosting population. So um, based on, on that, uh, I will not, anyway, you cannot read it, so I will not explain that. But we review uh, the literature based on the conceptual framework, looking at the way refugees would affect the hosting population through various channels. So not only looking at the most obvious channels, which are health, security, to some extent environmental degradation, but also through the indirect channels to the labor and the good markets. Um, so what are the kind of key lessons uh, we've learned from this uh, review? This is very small, so I'm not sure you can read. Um, first of all, certainly more evidence is needed. But to some extent, to, to really understand uh, how to build resilience in refugee hosting population, the focus on health and, and security is certainly too limited. In terms of resilience, what seems to be important is uh, really the role of labor in good markets as an adaptation mechanism in refugee hosting areas. 
So I just give you an example that maybe I, I know a bit better, which is Tanzania in the regions of Kagera. So there were about one million refugees coming from Burundi and Rwanda in 1993-1994. So quantitative analysis uh, suggests that at least in the short run, there have been huge uh, price increase following the inflows of refugees. So mainly uh, food, and the reason is mainly due to the fact that you have an increased demand from humanitarian workers, but also from the refugees themselves. Refugees exchange quite a lot uh, with the hosting population to diversify their diets. But the price effect is not necessarily the end of the story. In Tanzania, local producers reacted to this price increase by increasing production. Basically, refugees constituted a very cheap labor force to work on the field, and agricultural production uh, was reported to double around some refugee camps. So as you can imagine, this kind of labor and price effect would have very different uh, implications for the local population depending on their main occupation. So what we found in our, our quantitative analysis is basically market-oriented farmers would actually benefit quite a lot from the presence of the refugees because they could actually increase production. But uh, agricultural workers would actually face fiercer competition on the labor market. So we believe that it's very important to take into account this kind of distributional impact if you think about how to transition from humanitarian assistance to uh, development policy in refugee hosting areas. Um, also, what we found is beyond this market mechanism, what was particularly important to, to enhance the capacity of the poor to, to, to face these population shocks is uh, also the provision of local public goods. So the fact that in some cases, health services, even th those services provided in the camps, were made available to the local population. So another important point uh, is that we actually know very little about the long-term impact of hosting refugees. And when, when I'm talking about the long-term impact, it would even mean the impact even when the refugees left several years before. before. So we think it's very important to, to, to help us to, to transition from humanitarian assistance to development policy. And a preliminary uh, result we have seems to, to indicate that one important factor is actually investment that have been done by international organization when the refugees were there, for example, in roads, in infrastructure, to a very long-term impact um, on, on the uh, refugee hosting economies. So in terms of policy, I think what is important is what, what this kind of review tells us is we may need to, to, to invest quite a lot in the uh, capacities of the poor to adapt to this situation, but at the same time, we can capitalize on some of the investment that have been done um, by international organizations in terms of roads, in terms of um, also building on the social networks that have been created between the hosting population and, and, the, and the refugees. So uh, I think if I may conclude, um, we, we also identify uh, quite a, lo quite a lot uh, knowledge gaps. Well, <laughs> certainly need more evidence, more case studies. Or, 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 an, or review paper really focus on a few countries finally uh, where we find solid evidence. And it does not really allow us to generalize a lot of the findings we find. Um, so um, certainly that would be needed if we want to, to draw policy guidelines uh, for action. Um, also, we, we realize that there, there are even less evidence regarding the pros and cons of uh, certain options in refugee, uh, in protected refugee situation. Like, for example, the usual uh, uh, solution that, that are proposed by the UN Agency for Refugees, like repatriation, resettlement, uh, or um, local integration. We don't know much under which condition one of these options would be better for the local population or not. Uh, also, we know also very little about the relative efficiency of some intervention that are done in refugee setting. Like uh, we have seen that there, there is an increasing use, for example, of uh, unconditional or conditional cash transfer in refugee settings. But basically, we don't know exactly how it affects um, certainly the refugees themselves, but also the hosting population. And as a last point, which is almost a point for discussion, 
we realized that to some extent we would need to better align the incentives between refugees, policymakers, and, and researchers. Uh, to some extent, uh, for very good reasons, practitioners are very interested by quick evalu evaluation to guide their actions. While researchers would need also some time to plan to, to prepare the research design. And, and we may think about some way to institutionalize some kind of fast track research that would allow us to, to give preliminary results that would, guide, that would help to guide action and at the same time allow enough time for proper analysis. Thank you.